Hello and welcome to the Leaders in Supply Chain podcast. I'm your host, Radu Palamaryu, Global Supply Chain Practice Head for Morgan Phillips Executive Search. Today, I'm happy to have with us uh, Mita Vuk, Director of IBM Research Center and previously Chief Data Officer uh, for Blockchain Technologies at IBM. And the topic of our discussion will be, of course, blockchain. Specifically, we will discuss some of the practical case studies um, used by IBM clients around the region, around the globe. And we will also address some of the most asked questions around blockchain and this new and up-and-coming technology that a lot of, uh, a lot of our listeners have been, uh, have been asking us to go more in-depth with. So, Mita, it's a pleasure to have you with us today and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. My pleasure. So, maybe we can, we can start with a, with a big-picture question and... and uh, Uh, and uh, we've had uh, a good friend of mine, Charles Boer, who was the CEO of DHL Ecommerce, asked this. Um, and I think a lot of other people are asking this is, what exactly is blockchain? Yeah, so, you know, if you were to, and I'm a technologist, <laughs> um, the answer is it's distributed ledger, blah, blah, blah. But I, in, I personally think that blockchain is a concept, right? It is uh, an idea that is enabling the world to create one vision of the truth, no matter what you do. So if you look at the key tenants of what the technology can offer us, it's enabling us to create an ecosystem where there's transparency, there's one vision of the truth, and visibility and auditability. When you bring these key features together, and you bring this concept uh, together, it allows you to really make your existing processes better and actually rethink about some of the things we were not able to do before. So really reinvent um, uh, or invent new business models as, mm -hmm. we, as we do that. So I really think that blockchain is a concept. It's Technology is a part of it, mm -hmm. but it's the bigger idea that the world will be decentralized, that mm -hmm. what we do will be decentralized, that there will be more truth and transparency into what we do. And it's almost like peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, kind of peer-to-peer, -peer, enabling a peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized platform where trust can be inbuilt in the platform I and mean, if I'm to kind of summarize it yeah twice. so yeah, yeah so you know I mean from a technological perspective what we have you know the innovation um, that we've created technically is this ability to um, decentralize what we do mm. uh, create um, uh, auditability right so when you do have when you go look looking for truth in the system there's one version right nobody can dispute it because everybody who's participating in that agrees to that one version of the truth so technically you know um, we are creating blocks we are hashing them, them together we are chaining them together you know whatever that mechanism however we get to it the key tenant it's a, uh, it's a actually um, exposing to us is this notion of um, um, auditability immutability and transparency mm. right got it And since you mentioned uh, truth, and I mean, there's, there's truth, there's myths, and I think there's a lot of people wondering, um, um, I mean, naysayers as well as, as well as, as people that are very, very much supporting this, this new way of, as you, as you mentioned, maybe thinking about things as well as uh, backed by technology. But what would you say are the biggest truths and biggest myths about blockchain? So, you know, I, I, I do think it's a, it's a very hyped word. Um, I do think we are looking at a future where we will look at the things this technology has enabled and talk less about the, the word itself using blockchain. Um, we firmly believe blockchain is not a hammer and not everything is a nail. Um, but I think it has, it's very promising, right? It's very promising because it can not only help us reinvent Uh, things it, it's not going to, not only going to help us come up with new business models I think it is has key tenants to it that it'll help us redefine the way humanity operates right so think about it um, billions of people around the world don't have an identity because they don't have an identity they are more susceptible to human trafficking most of the human trafficked victims actually don't have an identity we don't have an identity that automatically can can transcend borders. The people who don't have an identity do not have access to finances. When you start looking at these things and when you're saying, well, because of what this technology can enable, we can live in a world of self-sovereign identity, it really started start, starts to at least question um, or address possibilities of solving problems that we've wanted to solve and, ha and have not been able to solve. Mm -hmm. So in my, in my opinion, I think when people say blockchain will not solve world, world hunger, Um, it's true, but I think blockchain will solve some very serious problems for us that we're facing as humanity. But like I said, um, we are starting this journey on blockchain. Right? Mm -hmm. We have a long way to go. We, um, you know, the 
if you have a process, for example, where there is no middleman, you know, blockchain is not going to be of much help to you. So, you know, you have to be very clear on what, what problems you're going to solve. But I really think that it's going to be very impactful and it has huge potential mm. on what it can achieve. So, so yes. So, I think if if I'm to summarize, you, you mentioned a few a few things. It's not it's not gonna it's not a cure all, and and definitely now, just you know, by the discussions and the hype, it seems to be a cure all, and definitely it's not a cure all. Definitely, it's gonna take time. Um, and I'd love to dig a little bit deeper, just in the example that you have just mentioned, which I think is a good example in terms of identity, right? And and, and but how for that particular example, right? In terms of millions, billions, maybe millions or hundreds of millions of people not having an identity the same not being banked because you don't have an identity how would specifically for that how would blockchain solve that so the way to solve digital identity there's different different ways of solving the, the problem of identity and you know i mean all some of the developing countries have taken a stab at that we believe whether you're solving the problem of identity for the people don't that don't have identity or making identity better for people who already have an identity. So right now, as a human being, my identity lives with several different entities. The government owns a version of my identity. All the social medias that I use have a version of my identity. When I go to a bar to get a drink, I have to give them my driver's license to prove I'm above 21 years of age, but I'm giving them all the information about myself. I'm giving them my name, my address, my date of birth, exactly. Um, I'm, I love it when I get carded these days, you know. Um, but, but think about a world where I own my identity. I can prove things on a need basis. So, you know, when I walk into a bar, I can prove I'm above 21 years of age without having to give them additional information. When I cross borders, right, you know, the the whole immigration uh, crisis that the world is going through right now, I have some form of an identity that actually is crossing borders without having a paper with me that the other government doesn't trust. So when we envision that future, right, when we envision the ability to create a bank account and prove things about myself, so whether, you know, if you, so if you look at the entire spectrum of what our identity enables us to do, can we really now address the problem or, you know, really create an ecosystem where we are looking at self-sovereign identity where I as an individual own my identity and I prove things on a need basis, right? Mm -hmm. And can we really create a world where these, you know, people who have not had an identity before have an identity? I uh, spoke to, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an example. Um, I actually spoke to this nonprofit in, based in South America where they wanted to microfinance, um, you know, a group of women who were, mm. who were working on developing, developing you know, little local arts and craft, um, so local artisans. These women didn't have an identity. So this nonprofit actually couldn't give them a loan because these women didn't have didn't an identity. They didn't have an mm. so so mm. what they did was they created this notion of identity where they defined the identity of a person and had that identity validated by members of community, mm. right? So saying yes, I'm Mita, and here are my five neighbors who validate that I'm Mita was enough for them to give out a micro loan Long. to mm. to these people. And you know, again, once you start, you know. Uh, really banking down banked in some form or, you know, you really get into this notion of uh, um, microfinancing, it opens up a world of opportunities for these people. Yes. So um, the notion of having self-sovereign identity requires identity, the underlying layer to be decentralized, to be able to support that. Yes. Right. It's hard for any centralized system to, to be able to support that. So that's why we believe it's a longer term vision. You know, we've, we are starting the journey on it, but we really believe that that's where the world should head. Yeah, because basically from a government perspective to do that, it's probably going to be much, much harder to do. And if yeah. you can you can kind of link it back to five individuals versus a government official or whatever it is currently that needs to go there, yeah. especially in the economies and the countries where typically which are not so developed, right? That's where the, these problems occur. Okay, makes a lot of sense yeah. and and good example. And, 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 and I just need to ask because, you know, we talked about truth, we talked about um, myths. I think this is a question that actually one of our uh, one of our listeners had, you know, uh, he, he's actually challenging a little bit. He, he was saying that, he, uh, you know, uh, everybody was big on RFID, right? The, the technology about 10 years ago and the media coverage and everything was that it's going to change the world and, you know, everybody will, will be transformed by it. And, and that was a bit 
10 years early. <laughs> it's just happening now. Um, so he was asking, what's the difference between blockchain and RFID as a, as a technology? Yeah. Do you think it's going to be a hype? And it's going to happen the same? It's 10 years early? Or do you think it's going to be different? So I really think that any technology that we talk about, you know, there are some technologies that are going to just sneak into our lives, like just like the iPhone and what it enabled. And, you know, we probably didn't see the journey of, you know, the technological evolution that happened for us to enable to create things like the iPhone, right? Um, any technology, whether it's RFID or blockchain or artificial intelligence, I think is going to go through the classic hype curve, right? So we are going to go through the innovation trigger, the peaks and the troughs of disillusionment, it is illusionment and the natural adoption of the technology, right? Um, having been a part of some of the chip design uh, technologies coming out, um, IoT technologies coming out. The one thing that I have noticed, with person I've personally noticed with blockchain, is it's pushing past its hype cycle faster than the other technologies we, we we've seen. Right? Is it going to play out exactly like the RFID technology? I don't think so. I think it's going to put. It, we are already seeing that. You know, we IBM started really uh, working on it. You know, the research IBM research has been looking at it for several years. IBM uh, started looking at it in th three years. And even in three years, we've actually seen people really move from the education to the from the tire kicking phase to doing POCs to actually doing serious pilots and running in production. So, you know, I personally believe that we will push past this hype cycle sooner rather than later. We will hit a world very quickly in five years from now where we, we will not use the word blockchain. We will talk about decentralization, uh, but we will not talk about the technology itself. And that's what success would mean for us. That's mm. when we will know, where, yes, we have been successful. Um, in terms of we as society get so used to doing things a certain way. So, you know, blockchain success will depend on how quickly and how easily we can, you know, solve problems that we have and seamlessly solve problems and became, become, uh, uh, you know, mainstream. But I think um, therein lies the challenge for blockchain, because we are trying to solve some critical problems that the world really wants to solve, you know, optimizing trade in, you know, improving efficiencies in food supply. You know, we do want to, we all as a society want to live in a world where I know everything about my food. I want to live in a world where supply chains are more efficient, right? And I'm getting better dollar value from, for the things that I buy. We do want to live in a world where identity is self-sovereign. So when you look at those notions and the need that humanity has for these things to become a reality rather than just the tech industry, you know, um, um, I think we will definitely see it most successful sooner rather than later. Mm. So let, let's let's go into some examples because I think that's that, that would make it and really bring it down to practicality, right? So And, and that's a lot of a lot of our listeners who are uh, who are who are wondering, maybe give us some some um, proof of concepts that, I mean, the, the further down the implementation part, and if you've had some implemented projects with your clients, that would be uh, amazing. So maybe just, uh, you know, if you can share some examples across industries. That you can. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I, I like to break it down into several, there are several broad categories, but if we look at just the big category that, you know, affect you and me in our daily life, you know, identity being one, food being the, being the other one, and money um, uh, being the third one. In the identity space, you know, uh, this again, this notion of um, a self-sovereign notion of identity. You know, IBM is IBM is part of the sovereign network where we are going to be a steward node. We are also doing work around uh, know your customer, corporate as well as retail, with that with a separate with several banks and several corporates, where we again want to make the know your customer process for banks really really more efficient and effective, right? We have a pilot running in, a serious pilot running in Singapore where the banks and the corporates, global banks and the corporates are actually testing the system right now. Um, in terms of food, you know, IBM has uh, a big play in uh, uh, actually making sure that our food is safe, right? Uh, tracking the entire life cycle of food. Um, hundreds and thousands of people, you know, it's uh, actually 420,000 people um, die every year from foodborne illness, 30% of those uh, are, are children, right? When we have a problem of that magnitude and we realize now we have a technology that can help us really not only make our food supplies uh, safer, but also re help reduce waste because before we had this, what would happen is if you detected um, contamination, the food supplier would have to pull all of the food. So, for example, if spinach was contaminated, they had no way of telling it's only specific spinach that's contaminated. They had to pull all spinach off the shelf. So we ended up wasting a lot of food. And it would take up to two weeks 
for us to be able to figure it out and take it off the shelves. Now we can do it in a matter of seconds, right? So, and that's that's almost we're working. In, you know, we're we're it's 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 becoming a reality. We are able to track mangoes. We are able to track pork and um, safety around those things, and adding more things as we go. Now when we start talking about uh, financial services, right? This notion of um, um, this notion of uh, tokenization of assets. For example, you know, tokenization of carbon credits, tokenization of incentivizing people to keep plastics, even plastics out of the ocean. They are becoming a reality. These things are in production. So, you know, based on, you know, whether whether it's work with the big banks to banks to working with the small corporates to working with, you know, food suppliers, we are starting to see things become reality under all these big umbrellas. And again, you know, trade and optimizing trade is a, is, is a big thing that we're working on. And we, we really think we can make trade extremely efficient and bring the costs down because currently, you know, trade is... Um, um, the trillions of dollars just trapped in the inefficiencies of trade, and we really think we can tap into into that to make it more efficient. Mm. So let's let's uh, so th- there's three broad categories, and and I think definitely, I mean, as, as you mentioned, and for consumers, for example, food is a huge one. But let's go down even even more in detail. Um, so maybe if you can, because it's almost like the question is how exactly does that work? Like yeah. so, you mentioned it. Okay, so spinach, you. You know, before two, two weeks to figure out which one was it, you take it out from the shelf, you kind of have to waste it, you know, and until the, the, the time that you track your supplier that was, you know, had the issue, it takes two weeks, a long time, lots of money wasted. Now you can do it in a matter of seconds. But how exactly is that possible using blockchain? I mean, it's, you know, from a practical, simple way of explaining it, yeah. how did blockchain enable that? Yeah, so, and I would like to break that problem into two parts. And just to touch on on something, Trade Lens, when we first started, it, it started that project in IBM, it was called Global Trade Digitization. Because the first problem we tried to solve was not decentralization, but we said, because we're solving this problem, it's actually we're also going to solve the problem of digitization while we solve it and um, digitization and decentralization. So if you look at the food supply chain, we really wanted food, you know, for after your farmer grows your food, it touches so many middlemen. And then it finally, you know, go, goes to the likes of big carriers Traders. like Walmart, or, you know, and then mm-hmm. finally gets to a store where then the consumers buy, buy it. Um, you know, we were talking about coffee earlier. Mm-hmm. Coffee is exactly the same way. We have no idea who grew our coffee. Right now, they are trying to come up with mechanisms of figuring out who your farmer is, but there's no way of tracking that supply chain end to end. So currently, in us in 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 this food supply chain, you know, coffee falls in, under the, that category. We have no way of tracking where in a supply chain certain thing is and how it was distributed and where it went. We broadly know that this batch of spinach went to these ten stores. So when you actually are creating uh, packages of food, we uh, start labeling them and we start tracking them. Once we start tracking those those labels and we track every time it hits a middleman in that process, whether it's the person shipping the food or the per- person just holding on to the food. And then now, because it's decentralized, um, um, when I have to really check, it's I'm not pulling one person or the central system that could be corrupted, right, to check where food is, I'm actually pulling the entire system. And I'm saying, hey, ecosystem of food suppliers, Mm. tell me, where did the spinach go? Mm -hmm. And because I've now built in tracking abilities, they can say, these batches are with are in the this store right now. So if you think this 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 spinach that was grown on this particular farm is with these um, stores at this given time, if you need to recall it, here's what needs to be recalled. Here are the specific packages that need to be recalled from these specific stores. Mm-hmm. So we can actually get that fine grained information. And now because the te- because I'm and I I'm I'm not just pulling a central system, but I'm pulling all the participants of the ecosystem. I know exactly where what I'm looking for is. So it mm. might not be at the store. It might be somewhere with somebody who's middle. actually in the middle. Or in the warehouse. Yeah, in the warehouse. Yeah. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. So now blockchain has enabled that, mm. right? Blockchain has also given me absolute confidence that nobody went and then tampered, that, tampered with that information. So I'll always know the truth, right? Because the moment somebody tries to tamper tamper with blockchain, they leave an odd, they leave an odd trail and they can't really tamper it because the blocks have been hashed and chained together. So it's you can't you can't tamper it. So it's tamper proof. Yes. Right. So now I know that's what I meant by the there's trust, one the vision, trust there's trust and there's mm-hmm. one vision of the truth. So no matter who I pull in that system, I'm, I'll get one answer. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, but from I mean, I, I just need to kind of uh, wrap my head around it personally, and I think that some of our listeners might have the same. Because from a, um, from a again practical perspective, so uh, there's there's a fair bit of work to be done in order to get that information and to you know even la- from practically right labeling yeah, 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 labeling yeah, yeah. the mm-hmm. thing getting all the different so let's say there's Absolutely there's ten middlemen idea. in between the farmer who farmed the spinach to the uh, the person the Walmart that sells it right there's ten middlemen all of them have to agree to yes. contribute and to be part of that and basically for the middlemen they may that may or may not really be in their interest long term right yes so the million dollar question then becomes how do and why would you why would they do that why would yeah. they come into is it because Walmart forces them to yeah, yeah which yeah. I've read several news that they do yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah. therefore you know they, they are kind of doing but you know I'm, I'm just I have to throw that at you because it's, yeah, yeah no no I mean it's a fair question and we mm-hmm. constantly you know so the biggest thing that that blockchain or this technology is going to do for us is it's going to um, uh, it's decentralizing everything right so the role of the middleman is either being completely disintermediated mediated or it's getting redefined significantly redefined so anywhere who's in the middle is questioning the yes. you know the, um, uh, the role uh, of this technology so when we um, when we see different ecosystems or when we build ecosystems um, together, when we build these ecosystems, whether it's ecosystem of trade, whether it's ecosystem of uh, food, or whether it's ecosystem of um, know your customer, when we start to bring these team players together, uh, and by the way, I think that's where blockchain has the biggest value. It's allowing us to have the conversations we never had before. It's mm-hmm. bringing all these people to the table. Before, we never had an opportunity to bring competition to the same table, mm. competitors to the same table. Um, when, we start to, when we start to have this conversation, and at the end of it, our main collective goal is to solve that one problem. So for the food trust ecosystem, we had one collective goal to actually create um, uh, food safety, make food safety better, to actually create transparency into, in our food supply chain. So if that's our collective goal, there are always going to be, you know, um, paper pusher. Uh, but if you talk to um, the guys who are running safe food safety for Walmart, for example, or Nestle or Driscoll, they will all agree. They all have <laughs> one collective goal, and that is, you don't want to watch somebody die because we didn't recall mm. certain food. We don't want to waste food. So if that's our collective goal. And we want to make this process extremely efficient um, and transparent. I'll be honest with you. Some people will believe in that collective goal and say, yes, it's going to cause me to really rethink and redo the, the way I've done it. But I I agree for the betterment of everything that's happening, even if it's financial incentive, I need, I, I want to participate in that. Most of the time that we've seen in our ecosystems, people are have this shared vision. So it's easier for them to come to the table. There will be cases when some have to come kicking and screaming. I can't um, uh, cite any example right now that comes to mind where we had to bring somebody kicking and screaming. But I do see, do think that when you're bringing 10 people at the table, maybe the 11th person is not a happy participant but agrees to participate in this ecosystem. But that's why we will also solve hard problems, right? Because right now we've enabled that conversation and people who probably don't want a complete disintermediation or decentralization are not going to be in agreement with what we do, right? But they can't help but be a part of this conversation, mm. right? So we are forcing this conversation that we should have had. I mean, again, back to your point, and I think back to our discussion before the, the podcast where I think that the, there was the example with the coffee, right, where the coffee producer makes $1 and Starbucks sells it, sells it for $20 or whatever it is. And that increase or hike of price for the consumer is because of all the different middlemen. Yeah, if we take out and if within with the help of blockchain, those some of those transactions in the middle are taking out or are being you know more efficient or less cost involved for the consumer. But obviously, the consumer will be happy, but the middle guys will not make money anymore. Yeah. So uh, for sure, uh, whenever it's there's a talk about changing the way things are, somebody will not be happy. Exactly um, right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. ultimately, as long as it's basically the the consumer benefits, is the same with e-commerce, isn't it? Right. I mean. A lot of the retailers are not happy that e-commerce came up and then, yeah. they, you know, they were going bankrupt. But, you know, consumers go to e-commerce and then, you know, at yeah. the end of the day, you, you have... And in, in this spectrum, right, for example, just the co- taking the coffee example, we are not only helping the end consumer, we are actually helping the farmer as well. The world's poorest people are farmers. Mm. And, you know, they're, they're the ones growing the food, but they're not being compensated because all that money is going in the middle. Yes. Right. And I'd love to... 
maybe you have i mean i don't know if you can disclose names of companies or, or anything like that that you work with but do you do you have some and maybe it would be even great uh, if you have some asian examples it doesn't actually matter so much in, in, in terms of regions actually come to think about it but do you have some you know maybe some data or some you know you've worked with x and this is you know what you managed to implement so far or there was a proof of concept uh, and then they were able to cut this much or save this much or improve this much or something along those lines? Yeah, so just, um, you know, again, uh, if we come to food safety, you know, we've proved we've proved that uh, just recalling food that would take them up to two weeks, I think they've brought it down to a matter of seconds. And in food safety, we have Walmart, we have Driscoll's, we have uh, Dole Foods, we have Nestle, you know, we have multiple participants in that particular network. So that's a good example. And it's very relatable because we are, we we as a society are getting very conscious about our food, right? And I I mean, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. I need, I want to know who grew my food. I want to know the farmer who grew my food, right? So I think that's a powerful one. But no matter where, which, you know, trade lens is again a big, big one for us, right? So in the work that we are doing with Maersk and 94 other um, players that have joined that ecosystem, that's again a big uh, ecosystem. And we've we've actually shown value um, uh, in um, how much efficiencies uh, we can bring into the entire trade ecosystem. Um, you know, we, we from a Singapore perspective, uh, we have done work around uh, digitizing electronic bill of lading negotiable as well as, well as non negotiable bill of lading and all the ecosystem participants that we uh, that we need there you know you think about big banks you, you know i mean we've done work um with everyone as the chief data officer of uh, for ibm blockchain i saw every bit flip on every single thing related to related to blockchain and i have to tell you that the interest and the work that's been done has been absolutely tremendous so, you know i was a skeptic and i'm a believer now <laughs> <laughs> and it's very data driven it's very very data data <laughs> data driven so we've just i mean you name it whether it's work with the fda whether it's work work with clinical trials on something or health records whether it's work with um, energy um, whether it's you name it. And we've, we've had conversations and we've done work around that, whether it was MVPs or POCs or pilots or production, you know, major banks, you think about major banks, we've mm. done work with almost mm. all of them, mm. you know, clearing houses. Yes. So, and them. if I am to kind of try to generalize, uh, and I think you rightfully mentioned just, uh, just now, wherever there is an industry or a, a chain, let's call it a chain or supply chain or whatever it, you may call it, where there's a lot of intermediaries, where there's a lot of middlemen, there's a much there's a quite a high likelihood that blockchain will be a quite a game changer. And wherever there is less of them or no none of them, then it's obviously it's not going to solve anything because it's already a kind of uh, a direct and and and, and yeah, yeah. Um, and and let's address a little bit the question with okay. So you, you let's let's kind of ride on the on the the, the part where you mentioned the e bill of lading and um, and uh, this has been affected. And I think there's been um, a question that we got in terms of the implications of other smart contract. Uh, um, type of agreements, let's say, in logistics and shipping, supply chain, in, you know, in, in this kind of um, archaic, if you want, industries, right, where it's been the same and the bill of lading hasn't been changed for decades and it's been very paper, paper-driven. paper How do you see blockchain as this technology impacting that and changing that or impacting that? So I think the entire digitization and decentralization of trade is going to have a big, big impact. And I think we'll make a lot of headway. You know, electronic bill of lading just happens to be one set of paper that mm-hmm. you're going to uh, digitize in, uh, in respect uh, of that. And, and I, I don't know. Uh, it's uh, I don't know if the audience know, but it's very interesting. We sometimes they, we spend more money sh- uh, shipping the paperwork across than the actual container. Mm-hmm. You know, I love avocados. We when we ship avocados, we have no way to tell which container has avocados. And you know, avocados—they're either too raw or they're too ripe. You know, that's that happy middle is very very hard to reach. You know, and I'm I'm personally very picky about, and I miss it at my home. I miss them, and but knowing that that's the container of avocados, it has it's four million dollars in in revenue. Um, in, in value, sorry, and that's the one I need to unpack first. That kind of information was just completely missing, right? You know, like I said, blockchain and the things that it's going to enable and the things it's going to do is is a journey. We are starting that journey now. It's started off fantastically well. I think we have places to go with it, um, but I, I really think that, you know, um, if you look at any of the archaic processes, it's going to redefine. Trade being the biggest one. I mean, all of them are going to be. Identity being another one. You know, I really also think that um, um, the, the, the entire notion of money, the entire concept of mon- money is, um, uh, gosh, 2,000 years old. 
right? And yes. it's still, you know, I give you a dollar and that dollar now belongs to you and it belonged to me. So, you know, and then there's a, there's a uh, rule um, uh, that says it's called the Nemo Dat rule, which just says you can't spend money that you don't have. Yeah, which has changed in the last couple of years. Yeah, it just changed, but and... you're still borrowing that money. Like, you know, yes, you're officially, yes, yes. like, essentially getting that money that you're spending. So smart contracts, in a simple way, allow us to honor that rule, right? And it's saying you can't spend the money that you don't, that you don't have. So I think just this, so smart contracts bring in an interesting notion of being, notions, of notion of being able to um, now do these things, right? So um, um, the things that, that so... I think in terms of things that affect human life, money, um, identity, food, mm-hmm. you know, trade, supply chain, trade. I think we'll see all of those change because of what smart contracts uh, contracts can do. I I have to say one thing. It's just digital enforcement and digital governance and things that it can do. But I have to say I find it very, very interesting. Smart contracts are called smart contracts. They're neither smart nor are they contracts. Mm. So, you know, if you think about it that way, it's just rules that are saying if this happens, we have to make sure that this is enforced. Right? Yes. And, and, and the million dollar question and the million dollar challenge is getting people to be on board and agree to those. Uh, you Absolutely. Know, to that, uh, so that's kind of if I'm to look back on the question and just kind of come back to the in some ways, because uh, we've had this in, in different forms from our audiences. Um, um, I guess it's it's. Where do you see in the next couple of years, right? Because I think we, you know, you obviously see a huge potential in this. A lot of people see a lot of, uh, huge potential in this. But where do you see as the biggest, and what's the biggest adoption and people getting on the platform type of? I mean, is it is it governments the bottleneck that will will, will be the most? Is it uh, the middlemen that will you know just scream and shout and you know they don't want to be part of it? Is it I don't know consumers uh, in some way, shape, or form. What what's the? So I think from from where we sit, I think the regulatory bodies have to move faster mm. to really start looking at this and 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 you know saying yes, the society and the world and the technology is now asking for things to be done a little differently. So we we should take a closer look at it and bless it. Um, you know that said, there are always regulations are in place for good reasons. You know, um, um, so, you know, I'm not saying that uh, go look at regulation and make anonymous transfers of money. Uh, okay. But I think for certain things that we're trying to do, you know, we all obviously need regulators and governmental agencies to take a closer look at it and, and bless it. From an IBM perspective, you know, we don't believe in cryptocurrencies or the entire ICO world. So, you know, if we take that out and we start looking at regulations around digitizing assets, um, we start looking at regulations around identity, know your customers. I definitely think in that environment, um, we could get a, quite a bit of help from regulators as well as governmental agencies. I think that would help push that and look forward much more than anything else would. That would mm. be the that would be most impactful. Mm-mm-mm. Understood. And other than you know the smart contracts, you know, creating this ecosystem for shippers, we've discussed trade lines, uh, specifically in supply chain, right? Uh, what do you see blockchain having the most or most impact? I would say in the next couple of years. You know, I I really think. Uh, Wherever there's a supply chain, no matter what that supply chain supply chain looks like, I think we can make it more efficient or uh, imagine new ones. Um, food, you know, we talked talk, 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 talk about food quite a, quite a bit, but I think food supply chain is going to be very impactful because the if you if you look at what society is looking at, you know, food sustainability is becoming agriculture. All of that is becoming extremely important. You know, food itself has multiple supply chains, not just you know food safety is one supply chain. You know, but there are other supply chains in this industry as as well. So I I really think um, I don't think it's going to be one thing that's going to be impactful. I think it's going to be multiple things that are important that are going to be impacted at the same time. So it's not that. Food is going to be more important. Trade is going to be less impacted. I think they're all going to be equally impacted. We are, you know, you talked about RFID and blockchain uh, earlier. The efficiencies or the things we could have could have done with RFID were incremental. With blockchain, we're actually turning everything on its head mm-hmm. and saying, "Here's a new way of doing things." So it's very different. Um, but I think it's we, the impact is going to be that much more, mm-hmm. right? With this. Got it. Um, and moving on a little bit to the people, to the skill set, to the, let's say, um, type of knowledge that we as individuals or, uh, or, or people in general should have, 
because uh, blockchain is a new thing, right? So he, there weren't even programs for it. There weren't, you know, university wasn't teaching. I think now one last one or two years they started to teach it in certain certain schools. Uh, one of our listeners was asking, you know, if he wants to become a data scientist, blockchain kind of expert, what should what does he need to do? How does yeah. he do that? How does he get there? And I, you know, I'll I'll take a step back, and I'm super passionate about education, so I can go on for hours, for hours. For, for hours uh, uh, but I've been an adjunct faculty a professor for 12 years, so I've, but my background is in computer chip design, so very, very uh, technologically focused. But if we, if we take a little bit of a step back, and the biggest power in my mind that blockchain is bringing to us is um, it's starting conversations we never had. It's saying now we have a technology that can do these things for us, and people who worked with each other but never really trusted each other and are not ready to sit down at a table and have conversations that they were not ready to have earlier. When we are going to enable things uh, because of the conversations that are happening, what are the skill sets we need, right? In most of the work that we've done, you know, technology is one aspect of it, which is a very, very important aspect of it. But I think there's a lot of heavy lifting done heavy lifting to be done around bringing these ecosystems together. There's a lot of work to be done to think outside the box. So, you know, when people ask me for what skills uh, we're looking at, if you're looking at blockchain as an idea and a concept to completely revolutionize how we do things, to broad categories emerge. Let's just say, and you know, for simpler terms, let's just break it in technical and non-technical terms. And let's look at technical first. Um, from a technical perspective, we've had deep researchers look at the blockchain problem, right? We've had um, deep engineers um, work on some of the applied research problems as we deliver things. The new things that are coming out around zero knowledge proof, you know, um, homomorphic encryption, we will continue to need um, deep um, researchers as well as engineers define this technology. And that's why, you know, in um, uh, in IBM, when we did blockchain, it was actually research was heavily invested in it, as was the business unit. Also, when we start to look at the intersection of technologies like blockchain and AI, you know, and how do you do analytics on data that lives in different sources, you know, secure multi-party computation. Again, we will need a lot of research to be in, 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 done, in, done in those fields. So that's where I would break down the category. And that's the skills that we look for. In terms of the non-technical skills, I really think that it's um, it's people who can think outside the box, you know, people who can really come up with new ways of doing business, defining new business, business models, um, designers, you know, we really have a hard time coming, you know, finding extremely good designers who can technically get what the, what the what what the technology can do and also figure out how to solve it how to best solve it right i think technology is best it so best serves people when it's transparent and is not very visible right and i think to get to that point we will need not just the technical folks but the folks that work on the business aspect of things as well so when um so for people who want to go into blockchain, my you know my um, recommendation would be that now education around blockchain, both in the business side and the technical side, is getting stronger. You know there are courses av- available on most of these uh, you know massive open courseware sites like Coursera, etc. Et um, we as IBM uh, have partnered with several universities globally, Oxford, Columbia, uh, around blockchain and delivering these courses. Even in Singapore, we partnered with NUS last year to deliver a course on blockchain, um, and it really starts with what problem would you like to solve and how would you solve that problem? And that brings in, you know, the business, the designers and the engineers together to solve that, to solve that problem. If we take a step even further back and we say we are really looking at a future where jobs are going to be uberized for lack of a better word. Um, we are going to look at completely decentralized market where the consumer is directly going to go to the buyer um, and there is no central thing controlling all of these I really think we need to educate the younger generation on concepts beyond purely technical and purely business. I think they really need to be thinkers. So, you know, my recommendation has always been take young kids, don't teach them engineering too early on in their life, teach them about art and philosophy and history. And then when you tell them, um, you know, here's the entire thing and technology is just a tool in your tool set, to solve the problems that really need to need to be solved, I think we will look at a very different world. Mm, got it. And then, because um, I mean, and also to kind of add to your point, and we've had a couple of 
actually there's been a lot and to be trusted not a couple there's been a lot and especially with it is overhyped and, and we've agreed on that I think uh, the, and there's a lot of private equity and venture capital funds that yeah. are putting money into uh, startups that are trying to do different things using blockchain so we've had the several inquiries and we've worked on a couple of assignments where they asked for a CTO to have a in-depth knowledge of blockchain and some of them came up with requirements seven to ten years and I said okay guys hey, seven to ten years ago there was no blockchain so yeah. what are you talking about yeah. um, and then basically it was a matter of finding somebody that has very good technical analytical and, and, and programming skills that has maybe taken a dab at some sort of blockchain projects in the last one to three years yeah. and then has has the soft skills and the management skills to manage teams because as a CTO you need to have that um, so pretty much that's how we found those those people okay. and it's you know it's kind of to add my perspective or my two cents as a headhunter uh, that indeed it is that it's kind of building upon what you said it is the technical skills but that that being said that you can learn and if you have uh, and pretty much you can you know you don't need to be a rocket scientist in blockchain you can pick it up and you can learn um, what's more important potentially and probably and is going to be more and more important as we move along with all these technology advancements is going to be the soft skills, the human skills, the human touch, the how do you uh, get your teams and people together to work towards the common vision and how do you get the creative around it, right, to maybe better orchestrate the model and, and put it in a way that hasn't been thought before. And that will shift our, you know, a little bit and will make or break. Yeah, yeah. A company, right? So yeah, yeah, true. And I mean, just to give you an example, um, in Singapore, you know, from a research perspective, we work on blockchain and AI, and then have started a strategic pillar on blockchain plus AI. We do. We spend quite a bit of our time doing core research, but we spend most of our time doing applied research. So we work with customers and deliver prob- hard to solve problems that have never been solved, that haven't been solved before, right? So even we as researchers who are delivering this, we always front end all of our work with a designer. Because the designer is saying, yes, you guys are very bright and you can come up with the technology, but nobody wants to use it. It's too ugly. Yeah, it's too ugly. <laughs> it's too hard to use. It's clunky, you know. I Just before we we were um, we started the podcast, I had a meeting this morning with some of the banks and corporates that we're working on. And, um, you know, it was lovely to hear because the first thing that the bank said to me was, the interface was amazing and it was quite idiot proof. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what you need, right? I know, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was lovely to hear that. That's idiot proof, you know. So, in and I mean, I'll be very honest with you. Researchers will, you know, you ask a person to change a light, researcher to change light bulb, right? There are 20 people in 30,000 ways we can do that. The designer front ending it just said, no, this is how the user needs to experience this. This is how you're going to expose it. I don't care. You are solving hard research problems. Solve them in the background while I surface surface this. And then the designers are, you know, they're very interesting people because they've spent most of the, their time um, in art and design and aesthetics of things. They really say, does that really need to be solved? You know, I mean, do we do I really need to solve? And they ask, you know, it might be a simple question and I might have 10 researchers looking at it. But when the designer asks that question, now we've started to take a pause and think, yes, if we can't answer her question, we're not doing the right thing. Yes. You know, oh, that's brilliant. I mean, yeah. do you need to walk on your hands if you can walk on your feet perfectly? Yeah. And well, that's right? what she's saying. <laughs> like, and I mean, I, I just have to share this. Right. So I was um, in terms of design. Right. So. And maybe the people in the MRT system in Singapore won't like me, but I will say it anyways. Um, you know, the, the sometimes I forget my, if I take the MRT, I forget the card, right? So yeah. there's, if you buy one ticket, uh, you can get some sort of a card. And then after five, there's some sort of a system. If you use it five times, you get 10 cents back. And truthfully, I never figured it out and I never bothered to figure it out because for some reason, and I, I like to learn, but for some reason, I don't want to spend my time figuring out that thing, right? You go to Hong Kong, it's the same MRT, MR, M, MTR, whatever they call it, it's the same system, it's the same way. You buy the card, it's a one... Uh, a trip ticket but at the end when you exit you just put it in the slot and it takes it away and that's it done right Uh, it's simple I mean it's much more simple I mean I don't need to figure out anything so you know back to the point and this was not necessarily to you know but suggestion to MRT system SMRT (laughs) maybe take it on board but um uh, it's design. Design should be simple. Design is the reason why Apple is what is, it is today, it's right? Yeah, and it yeah. is about the users and technology at the end of the day. And as you as you, as you you said, maybe in a couple of years, nobody will talk about blockchain anymore. It's just going to be, what can I do? And they won't even know probably that it is built on yeah. blockchain. Yeah. Right? yeah, it has to. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, I really want to live in a world where we don't say the word blockchain. Mm. We really are just talking about things it has enabled mm. and the new things we can do because of what the technology is under, underneath it. So, you know, that would be my ideal world. I do think, you know, I mean, and a design and just how we experience it is just going to be so critical. 
for its adoption as well. Yes. You, know, you just have to make it easy and seamless and beautiful. Yes. Yes. So. Super. Well, Mita, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate mm-hmm. your your sharing, your stories, your case studies, and, and it's been a, a real pleasure. And thank you for taking yeah, your time. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you liked what you heard, be sure to follow us on radopalamario.com slash podcast for all the show notes, links, and extra tips covered in the interview. Make sure also to subscribe to our emailing list to get the news in the nick of time. If you're listening through a streaming platform like iTunes or Stitcher and you like what we do, please kindly review and give us five stars so we can keep the energy flowing and get more people to find out about our podcast. I'm most active on LinkedIn, so do feel free to follow me to stay tuned for our latest uh, articles as well as future guests for the podcast and if you have any suggestions or any other idea please feel free to write to me i respond to all and also please make sure not to miss our next episode where we will be having a few other c-level and top leaders in supply chain joining us stay tuned